What's up guys, it's Maverick here with another episode of Akudama Drive. So, last episode, the series took a sharp turn, and I don't think it's going back anytime soon. Uh, certainly for Ordinary Girl, or I should say Ordinary Person, you know, our main heroine, uh, she's also bloodied her hands as well, and really is embracing the life of an Akudama, right? That's the path that she has chosen to walk, and you could also say that she's kind of maybe mentally impacted, mentally scarred in a way. So, it's not necessarily, you know, the, the best outcome for her, but I highly doubt that she's going to, able, going to be able to revert to her normal life after this. She's definitely ordinary no more. Um, and in a way, I could say that this is also truly embracing the sort of cyberpunk aspect of this series. So we've always had the aesthetic of it, and certainly there were a lot of uh, places where it felt like a cyberpunk world, but it never really fully went there, right? It never was that that sort of a dark kind of series. Even though, sure, people are dying and, and the Akudamas are killing people with no remorse or anything, it was still mostly a lighthearted tone. But now it seems that we are going woof into the deep end. So, uh, are they all, are they still going to make this into a satisfactory ending and all that? Well, let's just get into the episode and find out. Alright, let's begin in 3, 2, 1, play. Still, you two. Oh, you, yeah. I didn't even notice that. Hmm? And here I was thinking you guys were a propaganda channel. Apparently not so. <sighs> the shining? Okay. The shining. As in the movie The Shining? By the way, it seems that with- oh! We saw a uh, ordinary girl with her new hairstyle there. Apparently I stepped on a lot of people's nerves last episode, but, you know, I'm not going to just keep on praising a series, you know, and only looking at the good things. The way I do my reviews, I will point out parts that I don't like. Like, I fully admit that, um, the part with, you know, the courier and swindler and how they eventually connected at the very end there, sure, I will concede that point. But the rest, you know, the parts I do have some problems with in terms of, you know, the, <laughs> the setting up of the scenarios and whatnot, yeah.
It's a safe house, girl. <laughs> exactly. Oh, don't worry. Hacker's gonna show up sometime. I'm pretty sure Hacker survived. Take the fight to death. Yakudamada. Holy cow. This dude doesn't bleed out. If there's anyone most closest to a monster, it'd probably be him. Ooh. Damn. Well, congratulations, Hoodlum. Oh, I love her with her glasses off. I mean, at the end of the day, isn't that still sort of the same? <laughs> So basically, you have a power trip. <laughs> Oof. Wait. So is she originally a guy? And she's actually really old right now? For a few seconds there, she did seem quite old. What the hell? Pressing Akadama? By the way, sorry guys, I, I like I have an allergy right now, so 
Okay, really living up to her name now. Yeah, <laughs> just going into the dark side. <laughs> oh, it's cutthroat. to be you. Well, Do you know how much death you've already caused to the city, girl? Damn, he killed every single one of the executioners? Holy shit.
I actually also have a question. Like, why did Cutthroat suddenly... I mean, we always knew that he was kind of crazy, but he seemed fairly restrained. Is it because she actually killed as well? What is he talking about? What hell? The death and destruction that she's caused? Okay. I guess this kind of explains why he's gone to off the deep end. You want to explain what the red halo is about, dude? Hello. Well, he can see your halo, can he? Or whatever the hell that is. Now we've suddenly turned into the horror genre. There's gonna be a jump. <laughs> Holy shit. Is that gonna help? Bringing her to the roof? Oh, I have a feeling she's gonna let you see all the red you want to see.
kind of late, dude. <laughs> She's gonna open a door, isn't she? I wonder what those stuff were in the room. You're about to see a lot of red, dude. Woof! The drone? The drone. Oh, wait, no, it wasn't. Huh. Well, bye bye. Both of you. <laughs> so in the end, he never really explained what the red halo was. Okay, well, <laughs> see you guys after this, I guess. Oh man, I probably should have paid a little bit more attention to the title of this episode. I even I even said it out loud, right? The Shining, and I was thinking out loud whether or not it had anything to do with the uh, you know the Shining film by Stanley Kubrick. But uh, I was a little bit too engrossed in the story and thinking about all the other stuff that I didn't quite realize. Hey, they actually made a lot of references to the Shining film in this particular episode right particularly in in the latter in the second half of it where cutthroat comes onto the scene well we can clearly see them going for more of a horror angle there but they actually use the chance to sort of kind of recreate or at least sort of reference the the famous scenes from the shining right which to be honest i i didn't quite I didn't really get the first time, but now that I go back through it once again, uh, I would, especially the, the bathroom scene, that was the one that tipped me off. And then I looked around and said, hey, there's actually quite a few scenes that, um, that could say are kind of inspired, right? So obviously the bathroom scene is probably, um, the, the biggest one, you know, breaking down. Now, it's, it's kind of different from the actual shining scene. The actual shining scene was using an axe to break through the door, whereas here, you know, uh, Cutthroat just basically uses hands and, and so on and so forth. But um, it kind of had the similar feel, right? They're breaking down the bathroom door, trying to kill uh, Swindler and whatnot. So that was the most obvious, I think, reference there. The second one, I feel like, is also probably a sort of homage or reference to The Shining would be uh, when Courier and the sister and Swindler were all on the motorcycle and then they they were, you know, going across the hallway and then suddenly there was blood everywhere and then they skidded into the room where Cutthroat was, right? I think that's supposed to be the um, 
a reference to the elevator scene in The Shining, which is also quite famous as well because you see like blood flowing out everywhere, you know, like a like a flood tide and whatnot. But um, I guess due to the uh, the amount, the difference in the amount of blood, I didn't quite catch that one. But now that I go back through it and and think, hey, I'm actively looking for any references to The Shining, right? So I I feel like that scene probably kind of sort of uh, fits in with that as well. And then the last one I can catch would be uh, the hallway scene, I feel. Um, this one is a little bit more of a stretch, I think, uh, which is where uh, Cutthroat was chasing the swindler through the hallways and whatnot. And then we, we see a shot where he's standing in the hallway and then, you know, looking down and, and whatnot. I think that one's a bit more ambiguous because I feel like there's lots of scenes that have a similar... A sort of cut and layout as well, you know, a similar sort of framing and all that. So I can't really say if that's a specific reference to The Shining or not, but um, you know, I guess if I had to choose a third scene that that kind of sort of had the same feel, probably it would be that, right? So you know, just to throw this out there, I mean, it's been a long time since I've seen The Shining, so give me a break, okay? Uh, but yeah, definitely, I it was my bad that I. No, I even read the, the title of the episode and didn't quite catch that it was actually a direct reference to The Shining. But, anywho, anywho, beyond all that, let's talk a little bit more about this episode. So, um, no, obviously, having this sort of reference in one, I love this kind of stuff. However, you know, what has to be said still has to be said. And I think now, for these past three episodes, I can conclude that the series, the producers, the scriptwriters, probably have no intention whatsoever of co going through various plot holes and various uh, plot armor instances, right? I think that's, they're just, they're just like, okay, we just want to make an interesting series, deal with it, don't think too much in terms of the storyline progression and whatnot, and, you know, fine, fine. I'm not going to continue and beat a dead horse, but I've, I feel like I've already um, reflected all of my thoughts on this in the past two episodes, so we'll just leave it at that, right? Um, clearly, this is a series where we're not trying to really uh, break down and make sure everything is logically consistent. So let's put that aside for now. Um, I think the biggest question that I had from the biggest takeaway or, or the biggest uh, discussion point I wanted to take from this episode is actually in the sort of red halo thing that Cutthroat was mentioning. So again, if we are going to, to go back to and use a reference to Shining and all that, you know, it, it dealed with some supernatural powers, right? And in Cutthroat's case, I guess you could say, um, no, that is a kind of supernatural power, but I'm not that interested in knowing why he can see this or whatnot. What I'm more interested is in what exactly is that red halo that, red halo that he sees, right? In regards to, uh, the swindler. So the funny thing here is that I have two interpretations of it, uh, two explanations for it, but they go through completely different opposite paths. So the first one is actually something that I mentioned briefly within the episode itself as well. And so it comes with the concept of, you know, even though Cutthroat keeps calling Swindler an angel and all, and all that, and we associate halos with angels, right, with, with holy stuff, the fact that the halo is red, I think, obviously tells us something. So my interpretation of this is that, yes, you know, Swindler is an angel and all that because she she's selfless, she tries to sacrifice herself, she's doing her best to help the brother and the sister, and she clearly still cares about Courier killing some, some people, killing innocents as well, even though you know, I think it's kind of too late for that, right? And that's that's where the, the tainted red part comes in, right? Because she's already killed before, she's not innocent anymore, and um, trying to, trying to uh, go back to that kind of doesn't really make sense, especially since you could even argue that she was the cause of lots of the riots and killings that are happening in the city right now, right? Certainly that wasn't her original intention, but at the end of the day, it can all be traced back to her as well, right? She was a catalyst for all this, uh, posting, posing, well, not really posing, she is the swindler, right? Posting as the swindler and spreading this sort of panic uh, amongst the citizens and whatnot, and that is leading to what we have now. Obviously, there's other uh, attributes that are contributing to it, but we can say that she was diffused to this situation. So saying that she doesn't have blood on her hands, either literally or figuratively, you know, that doesn't really make sense. So I feel like that's what the Halo was talking about. So the fact that, hey, even though she's trying her best to do good, she's actually also staining herself red more and more in bloodshed and, and whatnot. And that is what's getting Cutthroat so excited about this entire situation. So that 
that's to me that that's that's the most plausible or that's the explanation that I would like the um this series to go towards because I feel like that makes things a little bit more interesting and a little bit more grayish if you guys know what I mean. Now obviously the the other you know the opposite of that would be to just clearly focus on the fact of Halos being being so things of good and clearly uh swindler is trying to do her best to help the brother and sister as well and maybe it's just you know the the motherly halo the heavenly halo the, the holy halo that kind of interpretation and you know how she's just trying to do good her selfishness sacrificing herself for others and all that stuff now to me that's a little bit more boring and you know that doesn't really fit in with what she has been doing for these past two episodes so i'm choosing to go still with my first interpretation but do let me know if you guys have other feelings on this Halo matter as well. So, uh, beyond Swindler here, um, obviously one, even though I talked a little bit about, um, you know, uh, plot holes and, and plot armor and whatnot, one thing that I won't say that they hand waved away is the part where she, um, she went into the, the, I guess, sort of armory room and um, managed to find some of the executioner weapons to fight against Swindler. Now, if we are talking about the plot numbers, you know I said I wouldn't talk about it. I still have some issues with how she's able to take down the, the uh, cutthroat so easily. Like, even if he was getting kind of crazy, he still literally cleared out the entire base of executioners by himself, right? So, yeah, I mean, but sure, let's let's leave that aside for now. The thing I want to point out is, um, I feel like it's not a coincidence that the drone dropped out at that time and rolled all the way to the door and whatnot, and the door was just just happened to be open, right? Swindler herself also mentioned this. She was like, "Hey, why is this door open? That's kind of strange." I do feel like Hacker is probably helped her in this situation in in some way. Um, not to mention, I do believe Hacker is still alive, and they're probably gonna meet Hacker again, right? Because clearly. Uh, brother is being taken to the Kanto district. They can't catch up with him right now. They're probably going to have to all head to Kanto to rescue him, as well as learn the truth about the entire situation. What's happening to Kansai? What's the deal with the executioners and the Akadama? And what happened in the history of this world, right? So, um, potentially we'll be seeing Hacker again. And so I feel like it makes sense that he was probably also the one that helped uh, Swindler in this situation here. Um, Beyond that, we also have this interesting conversation with the doctor, which um, yeah, that that was quite uh, quite some reveals as well, right? And the fact that she's probably actually very old, um, we can see that being a doctor, she probably uh, uses ways to to keep her appearance and whatnot. And then the second thing is based again based on the dialogue. I feel like she's probably um, did a male to female operation, right? She's a transsexual. Um, I think that's what that dialogue was hinting at because she she pointed out to him, "Do you see me as a woman?" Right? So. Yeah, I think that's a pretty heavy hint there, um, and I have pretty good confidence that that's probably what the case is. But, hey, more power to her, right? Uh, anyways, um, and I think that's pretty much it for this episode. Uh, let me think, make sure I'm not missing anything. The riots, the, the executioners, and all that. Yeah, I mean, I already mentioned the fact that I feel like the story is probably going to transition into Kanto now because uh, clearly the plane, you know, the, the carrier has already left with Brother. If they are going to get him back, they're going to have to go to wherever that that plane is going, and that plane is clearly going to Kanto, right? So I do feel like with the remaining episodes, we got three episodes left, I feel. I think, um, I think this is a 12 episode series. We're probably gonna get to see Kanto, we're going to get a big reunion with all the Akudamas as well, you know, the Doctor's probably gonna go, the Hoodlum's gonna go, um, and the rest of the Executioners are gonna go, and then we'll have one big final showdown, and potentially, uh, maybe the, the rioting Kansai people will also play a role in this as well, rise up against their Kanto overlords and whatnot, and um, completely disrupt the, this current power structure. But that's just the theory, of course, and we'll have to see as we continue on. So anyways, that's it for this episode. Hope you guys enjoyed this. I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.